while fashion music and the contraceptive pill were ushering in the birth of modern Britain as the 60s swung into action, things were fairly static at Vicarage Road. 1961 did see the erection of four new floodlight towers. The club felt it needed to apologise for their appearance in the programme. Pylons are never regarded as aesthetically beautiful, but we're aware that Watford's lights will constitute a new landmark, which we believe the town will learn to love, because they're an essential part of your club's bid for fame and fortune. The lights were in part funded by supporters who could add sixpence to their entry at specific turnstiles, and the Watford Observer organised a floodlight fund to help defray the cost, reported to be £15,000. December 1961 also saw a strange phenomenon. During the match against Grimsby, a hole appeared in the pitch in the Rookery End penalty area, and play had to be suspended for some time as Grand Staff rushed on with buckets of earth to fill a sizeable crater. Well, the site did used to be a gravel quarry and a rubbish tip, so subsidence was not uncommon, but not often during a match. It happened during an exceptionally cold winter when snow clearing was a regular occurrence at the ground before kickoff. But I actually grew up in Vicarage Road um, on the Hollywell estate. Um, and I used to be able to hear the games before I went to one and I kept pestering my dad to take me to a match. And um, we have actually, eventually I went to see a game in 1967. Um, and my memory is that there was snow on the ground and they'd cleared the pitch away and the big piles of snow on the touchlines. My dad moaned about how cold it was throughout the whole game. Throughout the 60s, there were many programme promises of ground improvements, but they were slow to materialise. There were even pictures of a new stand at Coventry that the board had visited with a view to something similar, replacing the Schrodel stand. The supporters' club was improved and local newspapers funded a new press box. And in 1967, the Watford Observer clock was installed on the rookery stand. As the decade progressed, so did Watford's footballing prowess, with the club eventually reaching Division 2 for the first time in 49 years. The promise of increased interest and the resultant revenue prompted the chair, Jim Bonser, to invest in a new stand, not, after all, a Schrodel's replacement. The pride of place, I think, was the main stand here, which mercifully eventually got replaced, which always looked very shabby. Um, it had an extension built onto it, which didn't match it in any way whatsoever. So it was an unfortunate asymmetric mess. So the ground was very, very mixed and probably the bit in best condition and possibly with the best view was the rookery terracing. So I can remember the old, the old greyhounds. I can remember uh, the new extension to the main stands. And again, that, that was a special day because my, fa my father found some extra money and we actually went and sat in there for the very first time and only time rather than paying the one and sixpence to just go on the Vicarage Road. The extension contained 1,700 seats, bringing the Vicarage Road seating capacity to 5,000. It opened on the 1st of November, 1969. But as so often relegation beckoned, and with Watford slipping down through the divisions into the fourth by 1975, so ground improvements were on hold, as the club had large debts from rental charges and loans after the optimistic expansion. To combat this, greyhound racing was introduced after a four-year break. It was just two very small stands, effectively, that which people went in, and everyone else was standing, effectively. So we used to stand uh, by the rails on the far side of the pitch, just at the front with our dad behind us, as a lot of dads did, um, and watched there across the uh, Greyhound track. So it was very different in those days to here. You, you were quite a way away, uh, and just after half time, you would try and look at the half time scoreboard, which was like by the side of the pitch to, to see the scores as they came in. It's very exciting. I've seen a lot of football at this club ever since I was five years old, and we played in blue. And there were two of the old stands. It's in my heart in my soul, 
you can't get rid of it. And just as well for Watford. Those were the words of Sir Elton John, who put his mouth where his money was in May 1974 and staged a concert with Rod Stewart that raised nearly £30,000 for the club and enabled him to become the majority shareholder. His next action was to appoint Graham Taylor as manager and usher in a golden era for the Golden Boys. So I was the ball boy the night we played um, Grimsbury Town and he was the fullback. And then uh, he was up against Stuart Scullion, who had a rather good night against him. Um, and we ended up winning 7-1. And uh, I had the opportunity many years later to go to a dinner with Graham and Malky Mackay. And I told Malky, I actually got the programme from that night. So again, I won't do the Scottish accent, but he said to me, hold it till we have dessert. So I did, and at dessert, Malky said to Graham, Frank's got something to present to you. So I presented him this program of the night, and he put, you know, he signed it, and then we had a photograph together, and he put his hands right round my neck, really tight. And I won't tell you exactly what he said, but he used an interesting word, and he said, you weren't the only person to have presented me with this program. The last two years of the decade saw several changes at the Vic. Greyhound racing stopped forever, and the pitch was widened. The floodlights were upgraded, terrace rails and barriers were replaced, and the bend, the area between the Vicarage Road and Shrodale stand, was concreted over. But in terms of setting the ethos of the club for the future, the 2,000-seat family enclosure was the most significant change. Alongside getting promoted to Division 2, it was a happy end to a difficult decade. <laughs>